On then to John Locke. John Locke is one of the greatest philosophers of all time, particularly known for his theory of knowledge and for his views on political philosophy. He was also a thoughtful Protestant Christian. Like many Christian philosophers and other intellectuals, he was disturbed by some of the hot-blooded wrangling about fine points of theology that seemed to pollute the air in his day. And there were many public theological feuds in the 1690s in England. Locke was so disturbed by these that he determined to set out what, according to the scriptures, is the minimum belief required to be a Christian. He suspected, of course, that it required somewhat less than some of these wranglers would have it. As a result, in the winter of 1694 to 1695, Locke sat down and pored over the New Testament to find out what it was that one had to believe to be a Christian. He explains the genesis of this book in a letter to his friend, the theologian Philip van Limborch. It seems that in the winter of 1694, he received from Limborch a copy of Limborch's book entitled Theologia Christiana. Locke writes back to him, quote, I must now thank you again for your Theologia Christiana, not because it has enriched my library with a volume, but because it has enriched me with knowledge. For this winter, considering diligently wherein the Christian faith consists, I thought that it ought to be drawn from the very fountains of holy writ, the opinions and orthodoxies of sects and systems, whatever they may be, being set aside. From an intent and careful reading of the New Testament, the conditions of the New Covenant and the teaching of the Gospel became clearer to me, as it seemed to me, than the noontide light, and I am fully convinced that a sincere reader of the Gospel cannot be in doubt as to what the Christian faith is. I therefore set down my thoughts on paper, thereby the better to survey, tranquilly and at leisure, the agreement of the parts with one another, their harmony, and the foundations on which they rested. When everything in this creed of mine seemed everywhere sound and conformable to the word of God, I thought that the theologians, that is the reformed, ought to be consulted, so that I might see what they thought about the faith. I went to Calvin, Turretini, and others, who I am compelled to admit have treated that subject in such a way that I can by no means grasp what they say or what they mean. So discordant does everything in them seem to me with the sense and simplicity of the gospel that I am unable to understand their writings, much less to reconcile them with holy writ. At last, with better hopes, I took in hand your Theologia, and not without very great joy read Book 5, Chapter 8, from which I perceived that one theologian was to be found, for whom I am not a heretic. End quote. In his very helpful introduction to his edition of Locke's The Reasonableness of Christianity, philosopher Victor Nuovo of Middlebury College in Vermont quotes the chapter of Limborg's book in question. It says, quote, As to the subject of this proposition, that Jesus is the Christ, the full and perfect knowledge thereof does not seem to be absolutely necessary for the truth and evidence of it. True it is, the person to whom the office of a Savior is committed by God ought to be apprehended who is denoted by the name of Jesus, which name signifies a certain man anointed by God the Father and installed in that office. But whether this person consists of two natures, one eternal and divine, the other human, both united in one person, has no reference to the truth of this proposition, but ought to be inquired after in other places of Scripture. End quote. Later in his introduction, Nuovo has some helpful comments. He says, quote, Locke's relief in finding himself, quote, not a heretic, in his letter to Limborg, appears not as a claim of orthodoxy, but as a claim of consistency with it. What Locke meant was that evangelical Christianity, as delivered in the scriptures, does not address issues of the divine nature of Christ or of the atoning significance of his death. This concedes nothing more to Unitarians than it does to Trinitarians, Rather, it extends to both the right to be considered Christians. End quote. The rest of this episode, then, are the words of John Locke. These are excerpts from his book. It's not a large proportion of the whole, and I've chosen to focus on what you could call his doctrinal minimalism, his argument that the New Testament requires very little as far as Christian belief. In next week's episode, you'll hear Locke answer some objections to this claim, and also say what else the gospel requires. Here then are the words of John Locke. The Reasonableness of Christianity as Delivered in the Scriptures by John Locke 
The little satisfaction and consistency is to be found in most of the systems of divinity I have met with made me betake myself to the sole reading of the scripture, to which they all appeal, for the understanding the Christian religion. What from thence by an attentive and unbiased search I have received, reader, I here deliver to thee. If by this my labor thou receivest any light or confirmation in the truth, join with me in thanks to the Father of lights for his condescension to our understandings. If upon a fair and unprejudiced examination thou findest I have mistaken the sense and tenor of the gospel, I beseech thee as a true Christian in the spirit of the gospel, which is that of charity, and in the words of sobriety, set me right in the doctrine of salvation. What we are now required to believe to obtain eternal life is plainly set down in the gospel. St. John tells us, John 3:36, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. What this believing on him is, we are told in the next chapter. Quote, the woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that spake unto thee am he. The woman then went into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man that hath told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Messiah? And many of the Samaritans believed on him, for the saying of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, many more believed because of his words, and said to the woman, We believe not any longer because of thy saying, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this man is truly the Savior of the world, the Messiah. End quote. By which place it is plain that believing on the Son is the believing that Jesus was the Messiah, giving credit to the miracles he did and the profession he made of himself. For those who were said to believe on him for the saying of the woman, verse 39, tell the woman that they now believed not any longer because of her saying, but that having heard him themselves, they knew, that is, believed past doubt, that he was the Messiah. This was the great proposition that was then controverted concerning Jesus of Nazareth, whether he was the Messiah or no, and the assent to that was that which distinguished believers from unbelievers. When many of his disciples had forsaken him, upon his declaring that he was the bread of life which came down from heaven, quote, he said to the apostles, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. End quote. John 6.69 this was the faith which distinguished them from apostates and unbelievers, and was sufficient to continue them in the rank of apostles. And it was upon the same proposition that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, owned by St. Peter, that our Savior said he would build his church. Matthew 16, 16 through 18 To convince men of this, he did his miracles, and their assent to, or not assenting to this, made them to be or not to be of his church, believers or not believers. Quote, the Jews came round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. End quote. John 10, 24-26 Conformable hereunto, St. John tells us that many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus the Messiah is come in the flesh, which passage might perhaps be better rendered thus, that Jesus is the Messiah who is come in the flesh. See Matthew ten thirty two, And so I think 1 John 4, 2, and 3 ought to be translated, quote, This is a deceiver and an antichrist, Whoever abideth not in the doctrine of the Messiah has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of the Messiah, i.e. that Jesus is he, hath both the Father and the Son. End quote. 2 John 7, 9, and 10 That this is the meaning of the place is plain from what he says in his foregoing epistle. Quote, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Messiah is born of God. End quote. 1 John 5, 1 and therefore, drawing the close of his gospel and showing the end for which he writ it, he has these words, 
Quote, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. End quote. John 20, 30 to 31. Whereby it is plain that the gospel was writ to induce men into a belief of this proposition, that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, which if they believed, they should have life. Accordingly, the great question amongst the Jews was whether he was the Messiah or no, and the great point insisted on and promulgated in the gospel was that he was the Messiah. The first glad tidings of his birth brought to the shepherds by an angel was in these words, quote, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. End quote. Luke 2.11 Our Savior discoursing with Martha about the means of attaining eternal life, saith to her, John 11.27, Whoever believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Messiah, the Son of God, which should come into the world. End quote. This answer of hers showeth what it is to believe in Jesus Christ, so as to have eternal life, namely, to believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, whose coming was foretold by the prophets. Thus Andrew and Philip express it. Andrew says to his brother Simon, quote, We have found the Messiah, which is, being interpreted, the Christ. Philip saith to Nathanael, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, end quote. John 1, 41 and 45. According to what the evangelist says in this place, I have, for the clearer understanding of the scripture, all along put Messiah for Christ, Christ being but the Greek name for the Hebrew Messiah, and both signifying the anointed. And that he was the Messiah was the great truth he took pains to convince his disciples and apostles of, appearing to them after his resurrection, as may be seen Luke 24, which we shall more particularly consider in another place. There we read what gospel our Savior preached to his disciples and apostles, and that as soon as he was risen from the dead, twice the very day of his resurrection. And if we may gather what was to be believed by all nations from what was preached unto them, we may observe that the preaching of the apostles everywhere in the Acts tended to this one point, to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Acts 18, verse 4, Paul at Corinth reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Verse 11, And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them, that is, the good news, that Jesus was the Messiah, as we have already shown is meant by word of God. Apollos, another preacher of the gospel, when he was instructed in the way of God more perfectly, what did he teach but this same doctrine? As we may see in this account of him, Acts 18.27, that when he was come into Achaia, he helped the brethren much who had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. St. Paul, in the account he gives of himself before Festus and Agrippa, professes this alone to be the doctrine he taught after his conversion. For, says he, Acts 26, verse 22, quote, Having obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that the Messiah should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles, end quote which was no more than to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. This is that which, as we have above observed, is called the Word of God, Acts 11, 1, compared with the foregoing chapter from verse 34 to the end, and 13, 42, compared with 44, 46, 48, 49, and 17, 13, compared with 11 and 3. It is also called the Word of the Gospel, Acts 15, 7. And this is that word of God and that gospel, which, wherever their discourses are set down, we find the apostles preached. And was that faith which made both Jews and Gentiles believers and members of the Church of Christ, purifying their hearts, Acts 15, 9, and carrying with it the remission of sins, 
Acts 10.43, so that all that was to be believed for justification was no more but this single proposition, that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ or the Messiah. All, I say, that was to be believed for justification, for that it was not all that was required to be done for justification, we shall see hereafter. We may therefore here apply the same conclusion to the history of our Savior, written by the evangelists, and to the history of the apostles written in the Acts, which St. John does to his own gospel, chapter 20, 30, and 31. Many other signs did Jesus before his disciples, and in many other places the apostles preach the same doctrine, which are not written in these books, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. What St. John thought necessary and sufficient to be believed for the attaining of eternal life, he here tells us, and this not in the first dawning of the gospel, when perhaps some will be apt to think less was required to be believed than after the doctrine of faith and mystery of salvation was more fully explained in the epistles writ by the apostles. For it is to be remembered that St. John says this not as soon as Christ was ascended, for these words, with the rest of St. John's Gospel, were not written till many years after not only the other Gospels and St. Luke's history of the Acts, but in all appearance after all the epistles writ by the other apostles, so that above threescore years after our Savior's Passion, for so long after both Epiphanius and St. Jerome assure us this Gospel was written, St. John knew nothing else required to be believed for the attaining of life, but that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. To this, tis likely it will be objected by some that to believe only that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah is but an historical and not a justifying or saving faith. To which I answer that I allow to the makers of systems and their followers to invent and use what distinctions they please, and to call things by what names they think fit. But I cannot allow to them or to any man an authority to make a religion for me, or to alter that which God hath revealed. And if they please to call the believing that which our Savior and his apostles preached and proposed alone to be believed, an historical faith, they have their liberty. They must have a care how they deny it to be a justifying or saving faith, when our Savior and his apostles have declared it so to be, and taught no other which men should receive, and whereby they should be made believers unto eternal life. Unless they can so far make bold with our Savior, for the sake of their beloved systems, as to say that he forgot what he came into the world for, and that he and his apostles did not instruct people right in the way and mysteries of salvation, for that this is the sole doctrine pressed and required to be believed in the whole tenor of our Savior's and his Apostles' preaching, we have showed through the whole history of the Evangelists and the Acts. And I challenge them to show that there was any other doctrine, upon their assent to which, or disbelief of it, men were pronounced believers or unbelievers, and accordingly received into the Church of Christ as members of his body, as far as mere believing could make them so, or else kept out of it. This was the only gospel article of faith which was preached to them, and if nothing else was preached everywhere, the apostles' argument will hold against any other articles of faith to be believed under the gospel. Romans 10.14, How shall they believe what whereof they have not heard? End quote. For to preach any other doctrines necessary to be believed, we do not find that anybody was sent.